Hey guys, this is Eddie Driptix here, and I just want to say, this video was recorded two months ago at 4th of July. With lack to decent amounts of motivation of editing, this 38 minute video was finished at 20th September, a one day gap before my birthday. How amazing. Anyway, let's get into the video. Hey guys, Driptix here. Welcome to another Obby Creator video where I introduce you the Obby Creator every true slash try a map making tutorial. This is the 2023 version. The old version is pretty much outdated since Obi Korea updated a lot and I don't even use the old bind mechanic in that tutorial anymore. I hope you learned something from this tutorial because this is going to be a long one. Without further ado, let's get into buttons. This will be the first section in the tutorial. Now making buttons isn't that complicated, but it is the mechanic I use for my maps it might be hard to explain, so let's build it. Firstly, add a conveyor into your obby. This would be kinda like a script for your button. Now in the behavior section of properties, set to conveyor speed to 1. You can make the arrows visible if you want to. We are going to be putting a push block on this conveyor, which will be the function when the button is pressed. In this case, we are going to add a part drag it into place and resize it so the push block cannot fall behind. Clone the part and move it one stand away from each other which will leave a gap for the push block to be in. Then clone again and move it to the edge of the conveyor and finally add the push block. Scale it and position it so it will fit inside the gap. You can change the color of the push block so it is noticeable. Sometimes the push block can freeze in position and I normally move it a half a stud up. Alright, let's get into the juicy stuff now. Let's add a button on the conveyor and scale it to be in front of the part, only covering one third of the front surface. Then I would clone it and move it to the side. Now I would select both of them and set both candle light and cast shadow to false and I usually make the tra buttons transparent. These two buttons would have different button types, the one being make parts visible and the other being make parts invisible. I'm going to label the buttons just for the sake of this tutorial if you don't understand. Now we have two buttons, one making parts visible and the other making parts invisible. If you are an advanced tools user, you can add a music part for the button sound effect. Now that we have all three parts that will be activated by the push block, we just need to move it so it will only cover all of the space of the part behind it. Okay, pretty much this is the part done for the button to be pressed. I just need to make a button myself. Just need to make it real quick. Also, I need to mention when making a button, you need to have a button that needs a bright color when it is active. Also, you need a part that is the same size as the button, but it is the part where the color signifies that the button would be pressed. So I'm going to label the colors of the normal button itself and the button after it is pressed. So yeah, the green part is a button and the black part is just a normal part, so you need to consider your button colors. Also make the press color part invisible, set the calculate force and transparency to 1. Okay, it's time for the real magic to happen. Let's link these together with the buttons. Make sure the green part is an actual button, because in this case scenario, we're going to select it and go to the behavior section of properties. Set the button time to make objects invisible, show time of false, and the time to infinite. This would activate this built function right here. The three parts, visible, invisible, and the music part. So let's click edit on the objects property and select the part which would go invisible for the push block to go through after the button is pressed. And click confirm after. Now that is done, we need to ensure that the button is pressed. It's time for these parts to take action. Select the button part labeled invisible, and if you haven't already, set the button type to make objects invisible, show time of false, and time to infinite. Also set push block activated to true and player activated to false. Okay, this is the button for make objects invisible, so to signify that the button is pressed, we shouldn't see the green part anymore. Click edit on the objects property and select the green button. Then click confirm after you've done it. Alright, let's select the button labeled visible. Again, if you haven't already, set the time to infinite, show a time of false, but leave the button type to make objects visible. Make sure that push block activated is true and player activated is false. 
Now link the button to the invisible black part and hit confirm. This is the part where the button looks like the button is pressed. Now move the part to be intercepted with the green button so it is in the same position when the green part is invisible and the black part visible. Let's test it. So when you press the button, it should work. The, it works just fine, but the music part isn't working. I think I forgot to set the sound ID of the music part. Let me get one from my existing button pre-made. If you don't have your own button sound effect, here's the music ID of mine. It is 692201969A. I'm going to copy my sound ID in my kit and pasting it into this music part here. Also make sure loop is false and the push block activated is true and player activated false. Okay, let's try this again. I'm going to reset the system and press the button again. Okay, now the button is working perfectly, but you are wondering how to link the button to the obstacles when being pressed. Let me show you. Alright, so I made these platforms and I'm going to make them transparent and can't collide false. So I wanted these parts to be visible when the button is pressed. I think you know how to do it using this function right here. Also, I'm going to label these parts just for the tutorial, so hold on. Okay, so obviously select the button which makes parts visible and link the button to the objects which need to be visible after the button is pressed. It is quite simple, so let me do a demonstration of me pressing the button. Watch this. And there you go, the parts are visible after pressing the button. Because not only the black part of the button is visible, but also these parts. So you can save the amount of buttons you need just for these poor parts. This thing also works for making parts invisible, so I'm gonna label this part invisible. And I'm going to select the button which makes parts invisible and link it to the part which needs to be invisible. So I'm going to test it again. These parts are visible and one part is invisible. This system can make parts visible and invisible simultaneously. But you don't want it to happen at the same time and just appear one by one. Let me show you. I'm gonna deselect these parts from the button and instead I'm going to measure the time length of how long these blocks should appear. I'm gonna add a part, resize it and put it beside the conveyor and I'm going to label it one second. Why you may ask? I'm measuring the time between the button being pressed and one second after it. It only depends based on the length of the part. See this? Since I'm measuring time, the z-axis of the part size represents 1, and that means 1 start, which is equivalent to 1 second, because I set the conveyor to the speed of 1. Since it is 1 start per second, I'm going to duplicate these parts into 3, just for demonstration in this tutorial. Then I'm going to add a button and just position it after the first 1 second part. This is the distance between the position of the push block and the button as they are one start apart. Then clone this button and move it one step forward on the conveyor. You can do this multiple times but I'm just going for three buttons just for the three parts to be visible. All of these buttons are the same property of the original button making objects visible. So let's go one by one in order selecting a button and linking it to each part. There we go, I'm gonna test it. One, two, three. These parts are made visible after three seconds. But what if you want to activate a moving part? Well, insert a moving part into the obby, just cluster the moving points together and position and resize the moving part into place. I'm going to recolor it and separate the moving points. Make sure it is button activated and reverse to false. And I'm going to set the move time to 1. So let's now take the visible button and clone it. This button will be resized and positioned along the bottom of the rest of the activation parts. 
This button has the purpose to mainly to activate moving parts, but it can also activate fading parts and falling parts as well. I'm going to label it and the only thing needed to do is to set the button type to activate parts. Now let's link the button to the moving part. I'm going to test one last time. There you go. Moving part has moved aside and these platforms appear one by one while one other platform is invisible. If you made it this far, I'm glad to hear. I hope now you know how to make functional buttons like I do because this is exactly the method I use. I recommend making this a pre-made because why not? I have my own too. Anyway, moving on to the next section of the tutorial. This next section will be about flood timing and the functionality of your map. This is basically how my maps function and as for me, it might be hard to explain how you can build it. This is to control synchronizing the time of the flood rising and any other moving part. This also involves the time length between certain events which is similar to how buttons work. So this is next following bit will require your attention on how to make perfect timings in your map. So let's get straight into it. Alright, I have built some simple obstacles. This is what I do for making a map. Insert a button and resize it to be a similar shape like a teleporter. Then obviously add a teleporter on top, but I would lengthen the height of it. I also make it so the button's color is similar to the teleporter and make the teleporter invisible. Can collide false and transparency one. Make sure to set the teleport location to the spawn of your map. Then once that is done, I will next add a conveyor and scale it to true stars thin and set the speed to 1 just like the functionality of the button. Now resize the conveyor in the direction of the conveyor's arrows and like the button, add a part so the push block cannot fall behind and clone it and move, one, move it one step forward to make a gap for the push block. Then clone it again and move it to the end of the conveyor. Now this is where it's different. I would usually add a respawn part as if the push block was able to go through the part without the round starting. This is also the reason for the push block being frozen in position. And make sure the property respawn push parts is true. And make sure to lengthen the respawn part so it covers the surface of the conveyor. I'm going to label this for visuals in the tutorial. Now add the push block and resize and position it so it fits in the gap. And optionally, you can recolor it. I move the push block up one stud so it doesn't freeze. Okay, now I would make something to make the teleporter visible and teleport the player to the map. Insert a part and clone it and move it just a few studs high. Then insert a button and position it just half a step below the part. This button will make the teleporter visible, so I'm going to label it just for your understanding. And make sure it is kind of collide false. Alright, I would add another push block on top of this, but let's just clone this existing one and position it on top of the part. In the behavior section of this button, the button type remains at make objects visible, time to infinite, and show time of false. Link the button to the teleporter and it shows this push block activated and not player activated. Now select this button and it will have the same properties as the other button, but the button type is make objects invisible and it is player activated. Link this button to the part, the respawn part, and the part which makes the teleporter visible. Alright, let's test this to see if it's working and we get teleported into the map. We get teleported into the map, the push block moves along the conveyor and we can do the parkour. Nice. Add the button just on the conveyor just overlapping the respawn part. This is the same thing with the timing with the buttons, but it is the timing with the map. Ensure it is push block activated, not player activated. The button type is what will affect specific parts within your map. Now this is the timing of your map. 
This is the same flow with buttons. You can use a part to measure the stars of the part because one star is equivalent to one second. So in this case scenario, this part is two stars in length. So when the round starts, it will take two seconds for this button to be activated and do a quick time event in the map when it is activated. This is labeled for your viewing pleasure. Okay, now let's actually customize of what this button is going to do after two seconds. For my map, I would add lava. You don't have to do what I exactly do. You can customize how the lava looks. Let's just skip a couple of seconds ahead. In terms of synchronization, you have to set it to button activated and set the appropriate move time for the flood. I'll just keep the move time at 5 seconds for now. Now move one position of the flood upward and if you want to have flowing lava, you will need to drag the lava position slightly to the side. Once your flood is set up, you can now select your button from before and link this button to the lava. Alright, let's test this. Okay, it's working fine. So basically what just happened specifically is that after the round started, the system waits 2 seconds before moving the lava. Let's try modifying our system. Now we have another measurement part that says 8 seconds, meaning how long this part is will be how long the push block would take to get to the next event. And that is 10 seconds in total. I'm gonna expand the parkour. I'm gonna take the bun from before and put it into my map. This would make sense for you watching this video. As you can see, I have made another floor which is underneath the first lava, and I'm going to duplicate this button and move it to the point after 8 seconds. Now I will link the button to the second flood. Alright, I'm going to test this again. It seems I didn't stretch the width of the lava enough. I'm gonna fix this. Now that I have done doing it, I'm going to alter the round system. I think 8 seconds can be longish. I'm going to shorten this part and make it 5 seconds. This is now 7 seconds in total can change your timing in your map at any time if you need to. The timing in your map is important if you are putting background music into your map. Now I would need to drag the button to the point after 5 seconds of the previous button being activated. Let's test this again. Okay, this is now decent. Let's say you have a path leading to the next room and you want to maximize the time you get out of this area by having the door close on the player who is late. Let's add a moving part. I'm going to scale and position it. This is also labeled for the viewers of this tutorial.
make sure it is button activated and reverse false. I recommend having the move time to be equivalent to the flood's move time. I'm gonna stretch this flood to be aligned with the door. Now that it is set up, select the same button and link that button to the door. I forgot to mention you have to move the door position to be at the pathway that will block the player from entering if they are late. Now let's test this. Okay, I think I need to move the flood position a bit more upward. That seems enough. I'm going to I'm gonna test this once more. Um, no, I'm late. Now you see how the difficulty starts to change as you make changes to the flood. Okay, I've made it through this time. This is how verifying maps work when it comes to developing my timeline maps. It is always hard. Alright, now I enclose the area with walls to look like it is the first room in the map. The flowing lava doesn't fit for this room. Let me fix this. Okay, let's test this again. Okay, cool. I'm going to move the button a bit closer so it will be faster. This is now 3 seconds and in total 5 seconds. You don't have to exactly copy this setup. You can customize your map's timing and synchronization, especially with background music. I'll show you how to add BGM later on if you have advanced tools. So now when it, the round starts, it waits 2 seconds before moving the first lava. When the first lava starts moving, wait another 3 seconds and move the second lava upward as well as moving the door. This is like a set of instructions in your map, except it is automated by a push block activating buttons. Keep in mind that the number of seconds are equivalent to the number of stars, which is the length of the part that stretches on the conveyor. Now let's test this map. Wait before I'm due, I'm going to set the first lava's duration to 3.5 seconds. Okay, let's play this. This map is way harder as you can tell. I forgot, if you set times for the flood, you need to set the same time for your door closing. So I'm going to do this real quick. Okay, let's re-attempt this. This is literally me when I verify my own timeline maps when they are extreme difficulty or above. As you can see, the system is working perfectly. To know how long your map lasts for, it varies on how long the conveyor is. So this is 43 stars and therefore the map length is 43 seconds. Now the most common part of making a map, background music. To do this is by inserting a music pad. If you can't do this, then you probably do not have advanced tools. The background music enhances the gameplay in your map where needed. Now make it can collide false and ensure this push block activated true and play activated false. 
It's advised to put loop to true since it is the music in your background. Now for the music ID. You need to choose what the background music is to be like precisely. I have a music ID for myself. You can always search audios from the creator marketplace. Since this will trigger the BGM, you can duplicate the previous parts and move it parallel to the music part. Select the teleporter button and link it to the new part. Now if you want to use a music part for sound effects in the map, it is the same flow for moving parts. Insert a music part on the conveyor, make sure you resize it the same as the button and position it correctly. Obviously, you can copy the properties from the BGM music part since it will need the same properties. Now this is the sound effect part. Public sound effects on Roblox are always under 6 seconds. I'm going to get one from my audio kit. Paste the music ID in properties and set looped to false. Since there is no reason for the effect to occur repeatedly. The music part is now added to the round timeline. Now I will measure it. This is one second after moving the second flight. In timestamp terms, the sound effect will trigger after 6 seconds when the round starts. Keep in mind that 1 start equals to 1 second. Now the instructions have been altered. Now when the second lava starts to move, the system will wait 1 second to play the sound effect. Let's test this! Now obviously this audio is copyrighted since it was uploaded by Roblox and it is the same BGM for the free sound innovation facility. I'm going to mute this part of the tutorial for the sake of it. Enjoy the gameplay and watch me as I fail a couple of times. Man, it was a bit difficult, but it looks like the first room's gameplay is verified. The round is still going and the push block is moving on the conveyor still. To know the push block's timestamp, let's say this was the push block's position during the round. Now I will measure this from the starting point of the conveyor to the position of this push block. Measurement is important when syncing is required. One start is always one second because the conveyor speed is one start a second. After procrastinating on this, we will now find that the push block is on the point after 10.5 seconds the round started. And therefore, it has been 10.5 seconds into the round if the push block was in this position. This is the timestamp of the round. It all depends on where the push block is located on the conveyor. If I would extend this measurement part and move the push block into that position, it would be 35 seconds into the round. The round time is specifically 43 seconds, so it will be 8 seconds left before the push block stops moving. And that is all for the section of flood timing. This was a long section to edit though, because it had to go through clear explanations so everyone can understand this. Alright, let's move on to the final section of this tutorial. The final section will focus on the agility. If you know what wall jumps, wall runs, and sliding are, yes, this is what this section will be about. It will be on making these mechanics. It combines of FE2 and Trio OS elements. This is what I'm able to build in my Obby Creator timeline maps. The ones that are simple and easy to make for beginners. Unfortunately, a zipline is a complex agility and can be difficult if you want to replicate the ziplines correctly from FE2 or Trio OS. This type of agility will not be included in the tutorial for beginners. Maybe for a future video. Alright, enough talking about it, let's actually get into building these mechanics. I will still use my example layout map for building the mechanics. The first mechanic is the wall jump. Now there are two ways of making a wall jump. Jump pad or fading part. Let's do the way I normally do when making my wall jumps. Fading part. It can be controversial, but I'm comfortable still using this. If you don't have your own wall jump image ID, here's the ID I use. It's on the screen right now, pause it if you want to copy it down. Alright, now for building a wall jump in my way. Add a fading part, place it in front of the wall jump and resize it to the same length as the wall jump. Set fade time 1 and time until reappear 0.5. 
After set the transparency to 0.95. And there you go, it is a simple way and I use it in my maps. This is the first way of making a wall jump. Some people do this and some people may not. Now obviously, when you stay on the wall jump for too long, you will lose grip of it. Now moving on to another way where a majority of people do this. They use a jump pad. There is an important part you need to know about using the jump pad distinctively. The top of the jump pad is always the surface where you are bounced from. I will add a text label to the jump pad and make it face top so you know where the top of the jump pad is indicated. While keeping this in mind, rotate the jump pad and make the top surface directly point to where the wall jump is going to propel the player when on contact. Now resize the jump pad parallel to the wall and ensure it is cancel light false and make it invisible as you can. Don't forget to set the jump pad as minimum as possible. In this case, it is 50. I don't use this method, it sometimes doesn't propel you to the platform directly. You can just have a lower snap to grid on rotate and rotate the jump pad in the right orientation so it can propel you to the platform. Okay, it is possible now, but still I don't use the method, either way depending on the community. Now moving on to the next agility at wall runs, there are two types of them, vertical and horizontal. Let's start by building a vertical wall run first. I'm gonna delete these two platforms. I'm going to clone the wall run part and move it to this position. Now for a vertical wall run, you're gonna need it to be resized upwards so it is tall. I'm gonna change the color of this too. Now here's how you build the vertical wall run. Add a moving fading part. Move one part so it is in the same position. Resize and position it parallel to the wall run. Now there is a similarity between this and the method I use for building wall jumps. When I build wall jumps, I use fading part, but when I build vertical wall runs, I use moving fading part. It can be moved on touch as well as fading out at the same time. In this case, moving fading part will be touch activated. That way, this moving fading part will be moved upward to make it so it is like a vertical wall run. Now make it transparency 0.95. Now head into the behavior section. The fade time and time until reappear will be the same as the wall jump method I use. So fade time 1 and time until reappear 0.5. Now here's what's different. Set the move time to 1 so it is the same as fade time. Set the activation type to touch activated. Keep reverse untrue so it can go up when activated and back down to reset. Move one position of the moving fading part to be up high on the wall run. Now when you test this, the moving part will be moving you upward on the vertical wall run. It is like the wall jump, but it moves you upward and you can jump away from the wall where necessary. Gotta extend this part. Playing the map doing wall jumps and wall runs will enhance your gameplay. You can use this for your maps. Also if you think the wall runs a bit slow, you can set the move time lower, example being 0.7. Then make sure the fade time is the same as the moving time and time until reappear after half of it. The wall run is slightly faster if you can tell. Now moving on to the horizontal wall runs. You may have seen these wall runs within my timeline mask, but you know what they are. If you don't know how to build these, let me demonstrate for you. I'm gonna make this platform shorter first. I'm gonna clone the wall run again and position it. This time, you don't need a moving part. Can, you can just add a conveyor and make it parallel to the wall run. Make sure the conveyor arrows are the same direction of the arrows in the wall run. You can change the speed of this conveyor depending on the speed of the wall run. Then make the transparency 0.95.
The conveyor propels you across the wall run instead of traversing upward, so this is considered a horizontal wall run. Now you have a working horizontal wall run if you follow the steps correctly of course. You should be because I want to teach and explain the steps precisely so you understand on how to do it. Now for the final agility sliding. I don't put sliding on my obby creator mask because the physics are goofy and it doesn't give up the gameplay and enjoyment I wanted it to be. But I'll show you how to do it anyway. So add a pipe and make sure it is two stars off the ground. Now resize the pipe. Make sure to get the fly beam texture ID if you don't have it. Make sure to add a barrier on top of the fly beam too. After that, add the conveyor on the ground. Resize it down as much as possible. Move the conveyor to the position directly under the slide beam. Set the transparency to 1. Now finally, add a trip pot. This will trigger the player to force it down and get into an orientation so the player can slide under the beam on the conveyor. Resize and position the part to be on top of the conveyor. Make sure it's calculate false and transparency 1. When you test it, it should work. My character is in a sitting position and lying on the ground to fit through the gap. That's how you make a sliding agility. Again, this is not used in my timeline mask because sometimes you cannot slide through because of the weird physics. It depends on the obby if it's your facing fate when you do a, this, especially in a harder difficulty map. If you combine all of the sections of this tutorial, this is my final result of my example map. That's it for this video. Let me know in the comments if this helped you or you've learned something new. I hope you enjoyed this video because this video took a ridiculous long time to make, especially me wanting to finish it before part 4. Well anyway, I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day and stay safe.